Joining us now to review headlines in today's newspapers from around the world is Arise News analyst Emmanuel Efeni. Good morning, Mr. Efeni. How are you? Good morning, Leila. Good, Good morning, morning Ruben. Good morning. It's midday, a quiet one at that. Yes. Uh, but uh, Happy Workers' Day all the yes. same. <laughs> because of social distancing. Sure. Maybe we cannot congregate. The workers will also do virtual, the virus, uh, the virtual yeah. celebration of uh, Workers' Day. Yeah, that's yes. what Issa Remo is recommending mm -hmm. in his article today. Let's uh, start with this day newspapers. COVID-19, with rising cases, federal government considers home treatment of patients, intensifies talks with hoteliers to use of facilities to expand bed spaces, malls use of military to secure isolation centers, says 113 health workers infected nationwide, 204 new cases push tally to 1,932, with 319 discharged, 58 dead. With 80 fresh incidences, Kano displaces FCT as second epicenter with 219 infected. High hopes of vaccine developed by Oxford scientists. Now, if we look at uh, the nation newspaper, just before we return to this day, Isolation centers running out of space for patients. Government seeks home treatment. FCT renovates cemeteries. 113 health workers infected. U.S. to give go ahead for trial drugs. Yes, um, of course, we still have rising cases in Nigeria. And um, 204 uh, yesterday uh, was the figure that uh, was added to the tally. And bed spaces about to be in short supply. Hoteliers are saying, no, you cannot use our hotels. And I can understand uh, in this climate where stigmatization is easy. If you hear that a hotel was used for coronavirus treatment, <laughs> well, that would be good goodbye to business when things normalizes in this climate. It's likely to happen. But the consideration of using, treating coronavirus vic uh, victims in their homes, that is a scary one. Because if there is a coronavirus case being treated in one's neighborhood, I'm sure everybody will likely flee from that neighborhood. But Whatever happens to... Uh, all the plans to increase and build new isolation centers. No, I addressed that earlier when uh, Leila and I were taking the uh, headlines. And I said, look, we should learn from other jurisdictions what they do. It's not everybody that tests positive for coronavirus or COVID-19 that you rush to the isolation center. Particularly, as we've been told, that 95% of cases in Nigeria present very mild symptoms. And I cited certain examples. Yeah. Uh, the British Prime Minister is self-isolated. It was until he started having severe respiratory challenges that he was taken to the hospital. Matt Hancock, the health secretary, UK health secretary, mm -hmm. uh, self-isolated in his house and eventually got better after the symptoms were treated. Chris Cuomo, uh, the yes. CNN uh, correspondent and anchor, you know, was not rushed to any hospital. He, he self-isolated mm -hmm. in his basement. And you have so many other examples like that. But the thinking here that anybody that has my, my symptoms should immediately be taken to an isolation center. I said, should be part of the strategy uh, that the Hikwazu says they are going to take a second look at. Secondly, uh, Minister E. Aniri, the Minister of Health, announced that we now have uh, up to about 113 infected health workers. And these are persons working in both public and private, private hospitals. hospitals. Now, that's quite a jump. A week ago, it was uh, 40. It was 40. Now we have 113. And he said, look, they, they should take responsibility. Uh, they should take necessary precautions. And that the uh, government will be willing to provide uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, but as in any case, which is the part of his statement that I did not like, that, you know, whoever thinks that it's not up to it can quit because we are all volunteers. I do not think that that kind of statement, if indeed it was reported correctly, uh, appreciates enough the sacrifice being made uh, by frontline uh, head workers. No, it's not as if uh, it's not appreciating their uh, 
sacrifices their efforts. No, in some countries, for example, in Ireland, health workers were told, if you are not up to it, please just pull out and go and take uh, social benefits. Because it's not everybody who has the uh, courage or mind to confront a disease that is very infectious. No, but you said this in terms of protests by frontline health workers and also the Nigeria Medical Association, that not enough is being done to make protective mm -hmm. equipment available to frontline yeah. health workers. And that places them at risk. Now, I mean, beyond all of that... Yes, looking at the figures, the spike from 40 to uh, 113 in two weeks, yes, it's quite worrisome. Is it that they are not making use of what they have? They are being careless. Because, you know, it got to a stage, like the doctor that died with his patient, where it was being said that, look, it, you remember, that was when the advisory came that any patient that come to your hospital, mm -hmm. assume that it's a coronavirus patient until proven otherwise. So it means that until, until, up till that moment, perhaps there was some carelessness that, OK, mm -hmm. especially at the private uh, clinic level, that, oh, she is my normal patient. This guy has been coming here. So I think until that advisory, there seemed to be some dropping of guards. Certainly, because the, the NMA are also saying the NMA's figures that they are quoting is that 300 frontline health workers have been infected with coronavirus, but the presidential task force is saying 113. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we don't even have clarity on the exact number of frontline health care workers that have been affected. And there is a mix of both public and private, whether the, they want to put more pressure on the private side, and it is more likely that we do have more doctors from private facilities, given the fact that they aren't actually trained to treat infectious but, disease. Uh, but we've, the had this, the we, we've had this problem. Recall the NMA president was on this program. How many doctors, health personnel died of uh, Lassa fever infections, 130 mentioned over a certain period, which means we've been also very careless uh, in our health facilities, both federal and private, in dealing with infectious disease. Perhaps that carelessness is what is being carried well, over. I don't want to, to accuse anybody of the, carelessness, but the uh, minister also made an additional point, which is that the federal government is going to provide training, uh, you know, and. Yes. Uh, regular training and retraining for these health workers. I think that makes more sense to me than accusing, you know, uh, health workers exactly. of being the ones who are will, uh, willfully uh, Putting them seeking to, to commit yeah. suicide. Yes. On the issue of training, if you just suppose that with what uh, Professor Chris Body said, that no loot doctor or health worker has been infected because they were properly pre-trained. So yeah, perhaps I agree with you that it's not every health uh, or every doctor that has been trained to be um, mm -hmm. uh, to deal with infectious disease. It, it requires some special training or preparation. Yeah. Perhaps we did not do that on time. Places where that was done, like in the case of loot, and they are at least uh, praising themselves that uh, they did that, and as such, no doctor has, or health worker has been infected. Training and retraining. Perhaps it's a lesson going forward that we don't have to wait for a pandemic or an epidemic, as in the case of Lassa fever, to train doctors who can deal with such Infectious ailments. Yes. Well, except that COVID-19 presents uh, new challenges. Exactly. But there was something else that came up yesterday, which he was uh, referred to, which is the proposed Infectious Diseases Bill uh, at the House of Representatives, which costs you know, very serious uh, disagreement. And I like the fact that he said, he advised that this is perhaps not the right time to do, you know, uh, to change the uh, Quarantine Act in the midst of a crisis. Because if you were to look at the details of that infectious diseases bill proposed by the speaker, Femi Bajabi Amila, it sounds very draconian. It looks like uh, <laughs> a photocopy of uh, a similar legislation in Singapore uh, 43 years ago. And what does that bill propose to do? It takes away you know, powers from even citizens. It makes a vaccine compulsory. And it has so many provisions you know, that are dictatorial, that even places uh, you know, the, NDDC, the NCDC uh, director general almost at the level of, uh, of a dictator. And the question is, was the NCC not carried along? Because you recall that members of the House of Rest kicked that they will need to study the uh, proposed bill, yes. because there was an attempt to rush it through. And many commentators are saying, well, this is probably a confirmation of the conspiracy theory that in dealing with this COVID-19, some people want to impose compulsory uh, vaccination 
on the entire world. But I, it's uh, curious, however, you know, that uh, is, even the NCDC director general himself is advising caution. Is, and I think that's not a bill that should be rushed should through be cautious. Now. Yes. Now, if we just look at the Vanguard newspaper, COVID-19 job cut looms. As Buhari falls back on Onrosaye's report, uh, President orders SGF head of service to implement Onrosaye report. We won't tolerate job losses, um, NLC, Serap tells government. Yes, Onrosaye's report, Ruben, you should know very uh, so much about that. It was uh, the Jonathan government that set up that uh, panel that recommended that um, the abolition and merger of 102 government agencies and parastatal, amongst others, to drastically cut the cost of governance. That report has been lying in the shelf, gathering dust all this while, but it's like it's going to be a very useful tool for the Buhari administration, uh, cutting the cost of government going forward. Well, the Onosai uh, Committee was set up in uh, 2012. It submitted its report in 2013. Then it was brought to council, because I was there then, you know, and debated. Uh, every ministry was supposed to look at what had been done and to pro provide information. Then the committee was, uh, uh, the committee that was set up to review it, eventually in 2014, uh, prepared a white paper. The objective is not job loss or job cuts. The objective is to cut fat from government, make government leaner and more efficient. Because the main thrust of that report is that there is a lot of duplication, you know, uh, and overlap. You see three, four ministries doing exactly the same thing. And you, the federal government now has such a large bureaucracy, is to reduce bureaucracy, reduce the cost of I It wasn't reduce personnel. No, the, the focus was not on reduction of personnel. The suggestion was that many of these persons will be redeployed within the system. But in any case, I don't think the Bureau administration is implementing it uh, immediately, because certain enabling laws may also need to be revised. So it's not just something uh, that you implement almost immediately like that by rule of thumb. But it's good to see that the government is thinking along the lines of cutting bureaucracy, cutting costs. And this is a clear example of how you can have continuity in governance, in my view. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Fenny, we do have to come to a close. Thank you very much for Thank today's you. headlines.